so calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and you're here this morning. I love those lyrics. You are all that we want, and I hope that's our attitude this morning. Jesus, you are all that we want, and a Chiefs win would be nice too, right? Uh, so this morning, I'm excited to share with you this scripture because it's one of the scriptures I have on my mirror that I try to read to myself every day to change the way that I think and the way that I live in this world. And it's Hebrews 13, 5, and it says, don't love money. I love our Bible. How countercultural is that first sentence? Don't love money, but be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you and I will never abandon you. And the reason I think this scripture is so important is 
Because in today, everywhere we look is something telling us you need more things and you need more money for those things. But the problem is after you get those things, it does not change you. It doesn't fulfill you. It doesn't give you purpose. But the truth is the more I try to accumulate of the things I don't need, the more discontentment I find in my heart. And so counter to what culture tells us, we don't really need more things. We need more Jesus because Jesus is the only one that can truly change you, truly fulfill you, and truly give you purpose. And so this year in 2024, I'm really trying not to seek after the things that the world gives, but the gifts of heaven. I want to seek after the supernatural peace that Jesus gives, supernatural joy and love. I want this year to be the year every day I intentionally seek God above the things of this world. And I'm not saying we can't have things, but do the things have you or do you have the things? Is God still above the things in your life? Because Colossians 3, 2 says, Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on this earth. This morning, would you pray with me? Uh, Lord, we pray to you so much for today. We are so grateful for who you are, God. We are so grateful for the gifts that you give that exceed anything that we can see on this earth. This peace that you promise us, God, this love that we receive in your name is so much greater than the things that we can see with our eyes open. So I pray that we would be seeking you above everything else, God, that we would be content and grateful for the things that you've given us because our lives are so good. The freedom that we're able to walk in, God, we should be able to praise you every single day. And today, that's what we're doing. We praise your holy name, and it's in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Would you all stand up and give them praise for what you have today?
God is fire. He's the rushing wind, crashing waves, and the sea and the snow and the storms. He is the beginning and the end of every day, the silence and the roar. He is the artist of creation, the master of every single detail. Present in every single piece of every single thing you have ever touched, every breath you've ever taken, every feeling you've ever felt. Love, joy, pain, courage, sadness, failure, and redemption. He is the beginning of hope and the end of fear. Beyond comprehension or imagination, He is here. The Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and that still small voice that roars like thunder. And the rushing wind, the desert rain, and the burning bush. God is fire. So this last summer, uh, there, there's uh, some different staff members. I don't know if all of you have gotten to meet them yet. We have Frank Whitney. He's my mentor, but he's also one of our teaching pastors. He helped us plant the church uh, campus over in uh, uh, Fulton, Missouri. Uh, now we have Travis, who is our campus pastor there. And uh, uh, then we have Jeff. You guys know Jeff Brandt. And um, we have Savannah. Savannah. Uh, uh, many of you, uh, we're jokesters, all of us guys together. We have a lot of fun. And this last summer, uh, Frank was mowing his grass. Now, Frank doesn't get around very good, um, and we try not to make fun of him for that. Um, but we have a lot of fun with Frank, and, and Frank can dish it out better than he can take it. Let me tell you right now, no. He, he, he can really do it. But this summer, he was mowing his grass, and people were driving by honking and waving at him real big. And he was just driving. And he was excited about mowing his grass. He loves to mow the grass. So he felt some heat around his legs. And uh, he realized his lawnmower was on fire. So we began to send him some pictures like this. Uh, all of us, when we heard about it. And uh, it reminds me of a consuming fire, right? Like, like it, it is all engulfed. It, it, it is a total loss. Uh, it, it, is, it is a big deal. And uh, uh, this was not his. But we sent him many like it. And uh, he tells me that he's got another mower now and all is good. And he's ready for the mowing season. You know, I, I was thinking about this as I think about God being a consuming fire. That he has the whole thing engulfed. He has all of me engulfed. He has all of me. He doesn't just have some of me. Why, he has all of me. So why do I worship? I can't help it. Y'all with me? I... I I can't help it. I, I must worship God. Why? Because he is consuming my every thought. He's consuming every little aspect of my life. Everything I do is based on him. Whether uh, he would approve or disapprove of my, what is going on in my life. You got your Bibles, open them up to Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, we're going to kind of teeter back and forth to Hebrews chapter 11. And I love here as we dive into um, people of faith, people that have been consumed by God. They weren't perfect, but they were consumed. Um, if you're perfect in this room today, raise your hand. Not me. I can't. You know, for all of sin and falling short of the glory of God, that didn't just pertain to us today. That pertains to all people everywhere for all time. Uh, they weren't perfect, but they must walk by faith. Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 1, here's what it says. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. This Paul writing here in Hebrews, he's saying, I got to get rid of all the sin in my life. I need to throw it off. I need to run the race that God gave me to run. I, I got to go through the life God gave me to live. He says, the way I'm going to do that is fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning his shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
Consider him who endured such opposition for sinners so that you will not grow weary or lose heart. And you're struggling against sin. You have not resisted to the point of shedding your own blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addressed you as a father addresses his son? It says this, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens Everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship at discipline. I love this. You know, I, I don't believe in a retribution gospel. I don't believe that God is up there on his throne and every time I mess up that he reaches down and zaps me or causes a bad thing to happen to me. But he is saying to us that we can look at hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us, that's our earthly father, for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time. <laughs> oh, sorry. I gave a tickle. I was just thinking about this uh, uh, Christian comedian. And he said his mom used to say, Jamie, you want a smack? Is that what you want? And he said he would look at his brother and say, hey, mom's handing out smacks. You want one? <laughs> no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but... Painful later. However, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be dis, uh, disabled, but rather healed. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance right as the oldest son. Afterwards, as you know, when he wanted to inherit his blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a, a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touched this mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. No, but you have come to a Mount Sinai, Zion, I'm sorry. Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkling blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. I got that in bold. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let us pray. Lord, I love you and I thank you for this day. I thank you for the time that we can be in your word. God, grow us, mold us to make us to be more like you. Father, let us fall more in love with you today, and it's in your name we do pray. Amen. Mm. Big idea this morning is worship God because he is the one true God. You know, I say that today because in our world, there are a lot of little G's, gods. In, in the day that the scriptures were written, there were a lot of little G gods, even in that day. And uh, they had names in that day. You know, there was Baal and Asherah and 
many, many more, thousands upon thousands. If you go to uh, India today, today in the country of India, there are billions of gods. Somebody can determine that a tree in their front yard is their god, and they can set up a shrine, and everyone must respect their god. In America today, we have many gods. Some of it's money. That can be our god. Sometimes it can be a relationship. That can be our god. Listen, children can be our god. There are lots and lots of things that are good, but they're not the best. They, they don't equal the one true God. And so this morning, we're going to dive into these people of faith, and we're going to talk about why worship. And here's the first thing I want you to see on your listening guide, is we got witnesses. We got witnesses. That's what he says in Hebrews chapter 12, 1. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, I've said it before, you're surrounded this morning by a great cloud of witnesses, whether it's a foot and a half in front of you or behind you or to the side of you, there are people who have been there, done that, and got the t-shirt. They've been through the, the storm of life. They've been in the same difficult situation that you might be in today, and praise God, they're sitting here today. Why? Because God brought them through the storm. Whether it was an addiction or something else like that, God was with them. They are witnesses. But this scripture, Hebrews chapter 12, is talking about Hebrews chapter 11. He's referring back to some people that their name made the list in God's word. Isn't that cool? Because they were people of faith. He said, we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Why these people did that, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says this about faith. What is faith? He says, faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. We are confident that we have a, a heavenly father. We are confident that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And we have a hope in, in him and an eternal life. A place called heaven. And he said this is what the ancients were commend, commended for. And then he goes on and gives us this list. And I'm not going to read you the whole thing. But I'm just going to bounce for you here through some of the scriptures. Verse 3 says, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. There is a creator. Amen. So that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel, he brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. In these days in the Bible, the day of Noah, uh, of Noah uh, there was water that would spew from the ground. But they, there's no recording of rain before this period of time. We don't know if it had ever rained before. No wonder people were looking at him like this out in the middle of the wilderness building a boat. Now, they had boats because they had the sea. So they knew what a boat was, but this was a boat. This took him a hundred years. And you can imagine throughout of a hundred years, he's over and over telling them, God said that he's going to flood this place, and I'm doing this to, to save all of us. Whoever wants to come, come hang out with me. But no one even helped him build the boat except his family. They all thought he was nuts. By faith, Noah, right? By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place that he would later receive as his inheritance, he obeyed and he went, even though he didn't know where he was going. Well, we got people today that still have that kind of faith in God that they would say, God, I am willing to go anywhere on the planet to let people know who you are, to just be obedient to you. That's what I'll do. He goes on and says, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regarding to their future. And by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons. By faith, Joseph, when he was at the end, uh, he spoke about the exodus and Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning his bury, the burial of his bones. And by faith, Moses' parents, they hid him for three months from Pharaoh. And then by faith, Moses again, uh, when he became Pharaoh's daughter, took him and took him in and made, her, made him her son. He refused to have the lavish life of of the Pharaoh and decided to live with the Israelites and live like they do. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea on dry land. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. And by faith, the prostitute Rahab, she received the spies into her home. 
And then in verse 32 of chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, it says this, and what more shall I say? I don't have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained uh, what was promised to, who shut the mounds of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle. They routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. They were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain even a better resurrection. Some faced jurors and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins, goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. And then in verse 39, it says, They were all commended for their faith. They were consumed by God. makes sense when you think about it like that. These witnesses were not perfect people. Now Noah, he got drunk. Abraham was too old. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob lied. Leah was ugly. Joseph was abused. Moses was a murderer and couldn't talk. Gideon was afraid. Samson had long hair and he was afraid. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah and Timothy, they were too young. David was a murderer and an adulterer. Elijah was suicidal. Isaiah preached naked. Thank goodness I don't. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Job went bankrupt. John the Baptist ate bugs. Peter denied Christ. The disciples fell asleep while praying. Martha worried about everything. And the Samaritan woman, she was divorced five times, living with a guy number six. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul was a murderer. Timothy had an ulcer. And Lazarus was dead. They were not perfect. But they worshipped a perfect God. Their worship and their persecution was voluntary because they were consumed by him. Remember with me the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. It says, for, we, for what we preach is not ourselves. That's what happens when, when, we're, not consumed, when we're consumed with God, we, don't, we aren't consumed with self. There's no room left for self. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord. And ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. And then I love this. He says in verse 7, but we have this treasure in jars of clay, referring to people. Jars of clay within us to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. See, we worship because we have witnessed the one true God. This morning, one of our guys and his wife, Aaron Roberts, Missy Roberts, they belong to us. We, as a church, send people. We sent them. They, they went to Enon Baptist Church as the pastor and pastor's wife. They serve there today. I often think about Missy and Aaron. They get to join us some Wednesday nights occasionally now, and I look forward to it every single time. You see, their story is about three years ago, Aaron was a meth user. And when he came to us, man, he was, he was just all in for God. He's like, I, I got to quit all this stuff. I just want Jesus. I want basically to be consumed by him. I remember he would have a day where he was struggling and he would call me and he'd say, Rusty, I just need to come by the church. I know that if I leave here, I'm going to go and I'm going to find the stuff. Or, hey, Rusty, my boss gave me cash today and I told him not to give me cash. And I got this quake in me that's wanting me to go buy the stuff that I shouldn't have. So can I come by and bring you the cash and then Missy will come get it after that? Absolutely you can. We watched him grow in the Lord. Watched him get into the Word. Watched as God led him in life to become a minister of the gospel of Christ. And now you wouldn't even know he's the same guy. When they worship, oh, let me tell you, I love having Missy and Aaron here. Because they worship loud. I mean, they go, woo! In the middle of a song, people in here, they look around. I'm like, what is going on? I read on Facebook one day, don't be mad because somebody worships louder than you. 
right? The reality is that, that God has done something big in his life, in their lives together. We worship. Here's the second thing, because we have encountered his assembly. We are in his presence Not because of what others testify, but because we have encountered God, right? You, you know, I, I know that God is more than a feeling, but there are certain days when they're singing up here. I mean, I love all of the music every single Sunday. I mean, it's just rock awesome, isn't it? But when we're singing, it's just something, right? Like there's some days there's, oh, man, oh, man. Oh, man, right? Like that, I don't know about you, but I was like, oh, yes, Lord. I was in the assembly in that very moment. I could feel the presence of God. Not every time. That doesn't mean God's not real. But I'm telling you, I feel him sometimes. And today, it was like, oh, yeah. I don't know about you, but I just want to be in the middle of that over and over again. Hebrews 12, 22, our main text. But you have come to a to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Do you picture that when you come in his presence? You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, kind of like those shepherds the night that the, that the assembly came to them and said, tonight unto you has been born a child. And they had great assembly and they, the heavens broke out in rejoicing to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirit of the righteous uh, made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, to the sprinkling blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. Isaiah, the prophet, in Isaiah chapter 6, he gives us another picture of what it was like to come before God. This was a vision that he had, but he was literally in the presence of God. He encountered God, Isaiah 6, 1 says this, in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and above him were seraphim, each with six wings, with two wings they covered their face, with two they covered their feet, with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another in this assembly, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, and the earth is full of his glory, and the sound of their voice uh, at the sound of their voice, the doorpost and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. I mean, can you imagine it? Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined for I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. This is a prophet of God saying, I am just a man. I am not worthy to be in the actual presence of a living God, the one true God. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And with it, he touched my mouth. And he said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Then I heard a voice from the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. Two things. Two things happen when someone encounters God, when they're in the assembly of God. Two things happen. The first one is they want to serve him. It's like a natural response. That's why we are often, people are saying, hey, if I just knew what God wanted me to do in life, I would do it. I want to know God's plan for me, his purpose for my life. Because if God would just tell me uniquely what he wants me to do, I'm on board. Why? Because when we come into the assembly of God, we just want to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We just want to please him. Isaiah said, or God said to Isaiah in verse 9, he told him to go and tell the people. And he gave him a message to tell the people. And Isaiah said to him in verse 11, then I said, for how long, Lord? And God answered him basically and said, until it's done. Tell the rest of your life, till it's done. Like, this is God's message for you and I. They, they wanted to serve him. The second thing is they were consumed by him. Isaiah said, here am I, send me. I'm consumed with God. He has my heart. Here's your third thing this morning. We, wor we worship because God is all-consuming. He is, isn't he? 
Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God. We are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken because the things that can be shaken will be shaken, but God cannot be shaken. He's the same yesterday, today, as always. What he has promised, he will do. What he promised in the past, he already did. It, there is no reason not to be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and all. This reverence meaning that he is God. I know that he is the one true God for our God is a consuming fire. Woo. Wait a minute. This, this last little bit, it hit me. Say this in your mind, for our God is a consuming fire. You can change it, for my God is a consuming fire. See, our God consumes the believer's life. You got to be careful. Does the one true God consume your life? Or what? What really consumes your life? There's a way you can know. You can begin to ask yourself these questions. What, does, what do I put my faith in? Do I, when I need something, do I go to God first? When I need money, do I go to God first or do I go to the my friends and my family and different people and say, I have this need. I, I'm not saying we shouldn't share our need. We should share our need. Or do we go and we, we extinguish all options and then we say, God, you got to do this. Who do we put our trust in? Do we put our trust in ourselves or do we really trust in God? Do we try to fix it ourselves first or do we go to God first? The one true God. What do we give most of our time to? Maybe our God's the TV. Maybe our God is a cell phone. Maybe our God is our work or our children or our husband or our wife. What do we give more of our time to? You know, they say the average Christian only goes to church once every six weeks. That's about eight times a year. Eight hours. And we say he's our one true God. What does a person give sacrificially to? Folks, I'm going to tell you something. Tithing is not just for the church people, it's for the preacher too. I give what I believe in. Folks, you're not alone and the, the sacrifice is real and I get it because when you need tires and you need this and you need that, but you've already made a commitment to God, do you give first to God and then figure out the rest of it? When we start thinking about what we give to, man, I can tell you, I'm a dude. I like my ammo. I'm a dude, I like my dirt bike, push button start. It's not wrong having things, but what do, we, what do we give sacrificially to? What has first place in my life? Whatever you answer to that, that really is your God. It might be a little G. And not the big G. See, I put my faith in God. I trust in Him. I'm going to give Him all of my time. He's going to consume me. I'm going to give Him all of my sacrifice. He is going to have first place in my life. Paul, the apostle in 2 Corinthians 5, 13 says, If I'm out of my mind, as some say, it is for God. If I'm in my right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all have died. Then he says in verse 15, all of us 
And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. He's a consuming fire because he loved us, because he forgave us. You know, I'm convinced if we can walk out here in the street and we can open a manhole cover and we can peer into hell for 15 seconds, that it would change the rest of our life. Because of what we would see, the hurt, the anguish that's meant for eternity, and the reality that Jesus came, that nobody has to do that. No one has to suffer, but they can trust in Jesus, and they can have his forgiveness and his love for all eternity in a place called heaven. It should consume us. We're surrounded by witnesses, but we're also his witness. We're his witness at our work, at our school. We're his witness when we go out to eat dinner. We're his witness when other people are being all negative, but we know we have a one true God that can do all things. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Your next step this morning is to worship God alone. To lay aside anything that has taken God's place in your life. As you walked in here this morning, you were given a piece of paper, maybe a pen or a pencil. There's some in the back of the seats, I'm sure, as also. You can leave yours there for the next group. But on that paper, what do you need to lay aside to let God be the one true God in your life? It's not for me. I'm not going to read it. What is that? That... What is that one thing that seems to be the thing that's your go-to? You trust in that more than him. What is, and you might say self. You might say money. You might say somebody else's approval. Listen, when we, when we care more about what other people think about us than we do God, we're seeking everybody else's approval. We're making them God. Maybe it's some addiction that you have that you say, I can't quit this. But it's become my God. And I want God, the one true God, to be my God. Today, after you write that down, in just a moment, during the invitation, you can either bring it up here and throw it in the floor or you can chunk it from where you sit. Wednesday night, I had them flying at me, and that's fine you're just leaving it here don't pick it up again when you leave this place you leave it right here and you make him number one in your life tonight or today okay Lord I love you I thank you so much for this day I thank you for the opportunity we have to be in this place God to to experience who you are God we know that your scripture says that Satan comes to steal kill and destroy our life but you come that we may have life and have it more abundantly so God we trust you with everything today God, I pray for each person as they write down that thing that they struggle with. That God, you help us let it go today. Today be the day. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Y'all stand with me right now. You can write that thing down. You can chunk it. You can come. If you need prayer, you come. We want to pray with you this morning. You come. All my words I got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do. But every song. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, I'm nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing high. Just one move 
with my arms stretched wide I will worship you so I Father God, just so thank you for the blessings that you've given us, Lord. Multiply this offering for your use and your service. In your name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Lots of things going on here at Life Point. If you didn't pick up a listening guide, make sure you grab one on the way out. Small group kickoff February 7th. That's a week from Wednesday. We'll have our kickoff starting then where you can get signed up. We've uh, got really active groups and we'd like for you to be a part of that. And uh, just so thankful for that. What do you have, sister? You have enough? Yes, yeah. Um, I didn't even hear what you were talking about. Small. That's, that's fine. Small groups. He's known me since I was a little bitty girl. <laughs> um, we have bookmarks that is um, that we're going to give to the ladies on the way out. It is the calendar of the new women's group that we're starting. Uh, the men started this fraternity, so we thought we better try to keep up, I guess. <laughs> But it's a small group held on the first and third of Wednesday night, the first and third Wednesday nights, um, and the calendar. And then we're also having fellowship for all of the women on the last Tuesday of every month. So a dinner and just get together as, as sisters in Christ and uh, grow. And I'm glad you've got a calendar because yes. how are you going to remember yes, all that? <laughs> Anyway, just, you know, she, she, to carry on what uh, Sarah said, they had 45 men uh, Monday night at uh, men's group here at the church. So if you'd like to be a part of that, I think they meet at 6 o'clock here at the church on Monday nights. Uh, you can be a part of that. Uh, one other thing we don't want to forget, uh, Best Choice brand UPC labels. Uh, the Gals of Promise, Mary Boatwright has been collecting these. She wants to re-energize that effort. It's things that you buy every day. Just... Grab the UPC seals and, and drop them in this box. The money that you get from turning that back in goes to missions, and they do a great work in what they're doing. But think about that. Look through your cupboards and bring those in and drop them in this box. They'll be by the front door, and uh, she'll collect them every week just like she religiously does. And uh, just th so thankful for what you do. But the best choice brand, the UPC labels, just clip them out and bring them in. 
and uh, we'll be collecting all year. So it's something to give that keeps on giving. So um, I don't think I've got anything else other than make sure you grab a listening guide because it is packed with things. There's a preach conference coming up. There's a marriage event in February. Uh, lots of things going on. And uh, just looking forward to be a part of uh, worshiping with you. So uh, enjoy the band as you leave. Have a great day.